Uh, welcome to the Friday morning program in our Community Innovation and Social Enterprises Conference, especially on this beautiful day. Uh, my name is Edward McClellan, and I will be introducing our guest speaker. Uh, we, uh, but before doing that, we're very grateful for uh, your participation in the conference. We have approximately 300 participants, many of you uh, practitioners in the community economic development field. Uh, this morning, for the final session of the conference, the plenary session, we have a speaker who will talk about the way forward, and our speaker is eminently <coughs> qualified. Uh, early in his career, he spent 17 years in senior management positions with the private sector in Atlantic Canada. He then joined the Government of Canada. He pro progressed through the ranks of, uh, of ACOA and reached the Vice President Chief Operating Officer position for Enterprise Key Britain. was also seconded to be assistant to the President of ACOA in Moncton. And during his career with ECBC and ACOA, he was involved in, a, in a many projects, some of them large and complex, uh, but a number of projects at the community level as well. For example, he, he was involved in uh, trying to maximize benefits to communities for the fixed length PEI project, which was valued around 800 million. He was also involved in maximizing benefits from the Hibernia work which was two or three billion, perhaps more. And he also worked with a number of community groups in arts, culture, manufacturing, uh, a number of different areas. Uh, on an anecdotal level, uh, I can give you an example of uh, where he was involved behind the scenes. In 1991, he brought in a person from Ontario by the name of George Francis, George Francis at the time he was teaching environmental management at Waterloo, but he was also director of the Canada UNESCO Biosphere Program. He, uh, he brought in George Francis, not necessarily sure of what would come out of it, but confident that something good would probably come from it. So George Francis came here in 1991 wearing his Waterloo hat, he uh, was staying in Big Pond, and on his first visit in Big Pond, he was looking over the Verdour Lakes and inland sea, saltwater and inland sea, and he was amazed at how unique the system was. And George said at the time, and he was the UNESCO representative for Canada for the program, that the Verdour Lakes should be a biosphere reserve. And that was the trigger that eventually uh, led to uh, the Verdura Lakes being in the UNESCO program. Pat wasn't necessarily involved in the details, but uh, that was the first step. And uh, I remember the first step well in 1991 because I was in Big Pond. George Francis was there and they were looking over the Verdura Lakes, beautiful inland sea, discussion about the biosphere program. They were looking from the inside of this lovely cottage and I walked through the screen door. So, so that's, why, that's why I remember that moment so well. Uh, he was also involved with uh, establishing a chair in management of technology at CBU in the 1990s. That was with the University of Waterloo, also included people from Halifax and other places. And he the, 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 was keenly interested in changing our way of thinking in, in uh, economic development. He supported uh, many community-based organizations in the arts and culture sector. His interests, energy, environment, innovation, community development, now retired, and writes for the Department Post. He's on the Board of Governors of CBU, and a few years back, he received an honorary degree for his uh, tireless support of economic development on the island. Um, we are pleased to welcome Pat Bates as our plenary speaker. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, as the clerk would say, do I sense a tinge of lobster hangover here this morning? 
My wife and I, my wife Patricia is with me here today just to keep me out of jail. Patricia's a criminal lawyer, so you know, I've got to play it safe. Uh, but she's, uh, she's quite involved in some of the things that I do. Uh, I want to thank Edwin, you know, he, he lied a lot in that particular introduction, but uh, I'll forgive him for that. But quite seriously, I'm uh, pleased to be invited to, to share some remarks with you this morning. Uh, hopefully my, my experience will, will offer some insight into some of the things we're interested in doing here. And I'll tell you a few other things about myself. I uh, just to add to what Edwin told you, in the private sector I spent 17 years with the Irving Group of Companies in Atlantic Canada. And I can assure you that was an experience. I have enjoyed it very, very well, and I earned every dollar of my salary while I was there. Um, I'm from a little place called Bateson. You know, some of you around here know where Bateson is, of course. It was the most lively, bustling, energetic community out there near Manitou. All of eight families. Today it's uh, Metropolis, it's 28 families. So uh, I, I don't live there and that's my loss, of course, but that's just a little bit about uh, my, my infancy, or not much more than that. Uh, but I've come to appreciate very much the whole business of social innovation and uh, in the many forms that it takes. Uh, when I was younger, out in Manitou and Bateson, my dad was a fisherman. <coughs> And this goes back to the days, and I won't tell you my age, you know, I just passed 29. But my dad, uh, he would renew his lobster license for 25 cents. Now today a lobster license will cost you a million bucks around for that, just to give you an idea of the transcendency of time. And my mom, <coughs> she was a high school graduate down there in Manitou, and she took on the role of secretary treasurer for the establishment of the Manitou Credit Union. Now this was uh, back, uh, some would say, in the infancy days of these social institutions. But nevertheless, the, the times were, were quite difficult. And people like my parents uh, were inducted into the movement to get the cooperatives and credit union movements off the ground and all them grew since. And just a little bit of a tidbit, <clears throat> uh, she, was, uh, she was doing the journals in the ledger one day in the kitchen of our home and she had the, uh, the books on the kitchen table. And a young friend of mine came in and he said, oh gosh, uh, Mrs. Bates, he said, looks like you're busy. She said, I am. He said, wouldn't you have a fancy cabinet to put all your books in? Oh, no, she said. He said, where do you keep the books? She said, I keep them under the bed. He said, what do you mean? Well, she said, with five kids here and more cranes than I can count, those books wouldn't be worth a damn at the end of the day. So the gist of the whole thing was a little bit of the infancy of my experience with, with social innovation. Um, enough of that. I've uh, been uh, managing to attend the workshops the past couple of days, and certainly the lecture here yesterday morning I thought was excellent, looking at the various uh, subdivisions of thought and thought process and the rationality of how we we measure the initiatives that we are trying to undertake and the usefulness of different perspectives. So I really enjoy that and I enjoy the other workshops that I attended during the day. So I uh, got fooled a little bit by George. We were supposed to be over in the, uh, the Royal Bank uh, session over there or uh, the facility. And I uh, sometimes try a slightly different format when I'm giving a bit of a talk to, to people like you and I've drifted away from the PowerPoint presentation mode and uh, introduced a little something called dialogue homily. Now I'm not a cleric at all, but this was uh, a new uh, device, a new technique that was established by some churches about 30 or 40 years ago. And the objective is it engages the audience in the conversation. So at the end of my talk, instead of asking for questions, as most will do, and we still do, I will try to engage a conversation so that the conversation is not simply between me and any one of you who ask a question, but it involves a variety of folks speaking up to the subject matter at hand. However, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to defray from that here because the configuration is a little different. And I forgot my ball cap, if you get my gist. You know. um, so I'm going to read some of my commentary here and make some make some side remarks in, res in respect to how I see, how I see the world. My, uh, my title is Community, Innovation, and Social Enterprise. 
And I better do this because that light is just a little bit uh, distant and I'm not five foot 12. The body of work on community-based development and various forms of social enterprise produced over the decades is quite extensive. Most of you people are already aware of that. One of the historic benchmarks would be the 1844 establishment of the Rochdale Society of Equitable Powers, hence the Rochdale Principles, a set of principles for the development of cooperatives that have been applied worldwide. The abundance of commentary, studies, research, and conferences over the subsequent almost two centuries is remarkable. The authors and practitioners from Reverend Dr. Moses Cody and Jimmy Tompkins, Alexander Laidlaw, to Doug Leonis, Richard Cashin, and Cedar Cobb. All are very credible examples of the dedicated leadership and scholarly attention, lending their time and skills in pursuit of betterment of our human condition. Through the creation of social enterprise, I stand in awe of their work. And I should say, my wife and I had the privilege of being up to Pogo Island on two occasions, and for anybody who can manage the time to, to get over there at some point, it's a very worthwhile visit. Wealth creation has and continues to be fundamental to the success of social enterprise. I should say that in some of the conversations I have with people, not so much recently, but going back a few years, the word wealth in some ways was seen as a dirty word. And uh, thank God that is changing because the realization that the accumulation of some wealth is essential to our business to get getting social enterprise and, of course, private enterprise off the ground. One of the guiding principles of the New Dawn enterprises, for instance, is local wealth creation. The Canadian government defines social enterprise as follows. Social enterprise seeks to achieve social, cultural, or environmental aims through the sale of goods and services. The social enterprise can be for not profit, but for profit also, but the majority of net profits must be directed to a social objective with limited distribution to shareholders and owners. Just a, a minor, how would I put it this way, description or differentiation, uh, in my view anyway, uh, that in social enterprise we, we talk about uh, payback, as it were, or a share value to the stakeholders. Whereas in the private sector, the common language is generally dividends to stockholders. In other words, whether it's Bell Canada or one of the other major corporations. And I want to come back to that in a few minutes in a somewhat different way. Closely aligned to the concept of social enterprise is that of social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship means acting within markets to help a societal cause. But as noticed, are noted in Ontario's Social Enterprise Progress Report of last year. The social enterprise movement is led by a new wave of entrepreneurs who want to balance earnings, a profit with making a positive societal impact. Wealth creation is a key goal of social enterprise. Finding the balance is the challenge. In the early days, and I guess for me the early days that I described about my mom and books on the kitchen table and this sort of thing, there was another phenomenon known as study clubs. And study clubs were also kitchen meetings. <clears throat> and uh, my exposure to them was a little bit like an adolescent, I suppose. Uh, my dad being a fisherman uh, was away, you know, for five or six months of the year. He was a welder and an iron worker. And my mom with five kids couldn't take the time out at night to go for these things. So I was sent off, you know, as a, as a student in learning, I guess, to, to participate in these study clubs. And people like Joe Chesson and Frank Glasgow, names that would not be current here now, would be the people along with a young, now Dr. Tracy McNeil, <coughs> in conducting these study clubs. And they were a form for engagement. Uh, I think we're missing a lot at the moment. Mind you, we have to take uh, cognizance of how things have changed in communication and so on. But the study club phenomena was just a miraculous device in those days uh, to exchange people's views, of course, and to help with and the whole business of adult education. Now, the fact that we got tea and some fire cookies during the process didn't hurt a darn bit. But I want to come to this business of uh, public engagement uh, in a different form in just a few minutes. 
So I like to think I commence from an evolving platform. It is my position that the way forward for social enterprise movement will be driven to the extent it can exploit and enhance its appeal in at least three distinct areas. Leadership, competence and management, and ability to adapt to the age of research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I should have got that glass of water, Trish, so I could turn these pages a little easier. The component parts, <coughs> management, as form, former, first and foremost, dedicated and competent management is essential for the survival and progression of any new enterprise, whether a social or private corporation. Social enterprise can be quite vulnerable to this element of entrepreneurship. For example, economists Dodar and Pluta in their book, The Big Picture, the Anakinish Movement of Eastern Nova Scotia, there you go, ask and you shall receive. <laughs> uh, a retrospective on the Anakinish Movement raised the issue of weakened management in the client, decline of the cooperative movement in the 1960s and 70s. Mind you, private and corporate entrepreneurs suffered their own share of management failure, especially within the small to medium category, where statistics indicate that two-thirds of small enterprise fail within the first five years. Referencing new startups, business columnists such as the Globe and Mail's Guy Dixon writes about the urgency of paying attention to the importance of competence in management early on in attempting new startups. The Ivy School of Business, people know it's one of the top school in business in the country at University of Western Ontario, has recently been inviting guest speakers to talk to students about failures as much as success. This action is as applicable to more senior aspiring entrepreneurs and groups of associations as it is to graduating university students. Um, I should make a note here to myself about recognizing the distinction between private sector management and citizen stakeholder enterprise. Private sector from my days, and uh, it wasn't only with the early group of companies, but in dealing with applicants for grant assistance and financial assistance from the uh, various government agencies, uh, will look more closely at balance sheet. It'll look closely at cash flow. It'll look very closely at uh, you know, the report, report, the first quarter annual report from the auditors, you know, this all brings forward a sweat sometimes. And that's important, very important in the, in the public enterprise also. But the distinction I make, <coughs> and it's important, is the dedication of management in the, in the uh, social enterprise movement. In other words, it's the people, bottom line, that really counts. And as a consequence, instead of worrying about the return on discount or discount uh, share value to the uh, to the shareholders at the end of the year. It's a measure of how well the individual stakeholder is doing or fearing from their participation in the social enterprise. So it is a distinction and uh, management sometimes is very slow to, to catch on to the importance of that particular element. Uh, research innovation and entrepreneurship. The challenge I wish to raise with the entire, I have to start using that bottle of water, Tina. The entire community-based development, social enterprise and innovation fraternity is on a go forward basis and the challenges are leaders and proponents ready to embrace and exploit the current triple trust of research, innovation and entrepreneurship. Why am I posing this question? Because social enterprise, in my view, is the most overt form of economic sociology within the context of recent economic history. Society is searching for new economic, social, and business forms of sustainable entrepreneurship. Consequently, the whole approach takes on a different sense of mission and vision in how we approach that. It's time I just make a note of some comments lately by Jim Basilian. And Basilia is the guy, or the partner, or the co-inventor of that cell phone most of you are carrying in your best pocket, or your, your apron, or whatever it is today. And Basilia's view on communication, on, on invention, and so on, is largely a private sector view, but it's very, very important because she's claiming that the federal government policy 
on innovation is, uh, is lax, is uh, vacant or quiet on some of the key uh, elements of private sector policy. His basic criticism is that, and it's anchored in his idea of wealth, wealth generation, is that we are not earning our wealth potential in the export market simply because we are not creating through innovation enough new startups, enough new products and services that can be patented, that can be registered, and that can be exported. And he has written quite substantially about this issue in the past six or eight months. So his, uh, his reading is certainly, his writing rather, is certainly uh, worth reading by anybody who, who is interested. I might mention there's another side to this argument that's been surfacing in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, I don't have the name of the originators of this particular uh, point of view, but it has to do with the tendency for Canadian inventors to uh, do well in a startup and very promptly take advantage of a good offer from a foreign buyer to buy their, their new uh, crea creation. And the gist of that is that there should be at least uh, more encouragement for Canadian uh, inventors to look at the uh, look at the loss you know, to the Canadian economy when a transaction of that nature takes place quickly. The difficulty is we live in a free society and as individuals we're free to do what's in our best interest and, and that includes you know, sharing or, or capturing the, the investment and feedback from our inventions if we are fortunate enough to be in that category. Um, just on the subject now of startups, uh, this subject got a lot of attention yesterday, at least in some of the workshops that I, I attended. Very, very important. And uh, it's, it's something that I think social entrepreneurs are going to be obliged to take more start in and, and find out ways to engage government. I know there was one particular presentation yesterday uh, on agriculture. A, a young man who's working very hard to establish an agricultural business in Pictou County. And he talked about the whole variety of things that he had done, just an enormous amount of effort that has gone into it. But it's indicative of what's been recommended now uh, right across the board in terms of the importance of new startups. I found it kind of interesting in the last few days, uh, in fact I was going to mention the item this morning, that God has arrived and it's not me. But the United Church of Canada has just announced uh, it is uh, scheduling the uh, Markham United Church in Toronto as the new hub. And I think they have 23 new startups that are getting placed in this particular building. It's a new, uh, new ground for churches, but a very encouraging one. And uh, this is a way in a large metropolitan area for taking advantage of some of the, uh, the church buildings, etc., that are not in, uh, in use now. Nobody has to go any further than the new Don Enterprise in Sydney, which really is a, a church-related organization. It was a convent for, for nuns, as most of you will realize, and it's just serving a miraculous purpose, I think, here. But in addition to that, uh, churches must be more vocal. And speaking about EU success, it's another dimension to that little story, and this comes from, uh, from Ireland, and of course, it's surfacing out of the bricks that issue. And the, the churches, a whole list of various churches uh, in, uh, in Western Europe are now uh, encouraging their populations to get actively involved in the whole business of the entrepreneurial enterprise. And, uh, and they're going to be finding ways to find some money, venture capital, to assist in this. So it's a new movement. Uh, leadership. Social entrepreneurs building and growing their companies. The understanding and practice of leadership are critical for their organizations long term. There's the constant struggle of balancing the social mission against commercial growth and success. I want to talk about something I call contemporary theory. Canada's future economic prospects and growth must be energized by innovation. The subject matter is vast and the language continuously revolves around common terms, i.e. science, technology, innovation, research, universe participation, and entrepreneurship. 
At the moment, the movement is driven by the federal government's endorsement and very substantial funding commitments. This, I think, is <clears throat> where I would be asking or suggesting that the whole phenomenon of uh, social enterprise can start looking at uh, new possibilities. The first industrial revolution was born of the mechanization of production using water and steam and power, and it focused on the railways and steam factors of, of that day. The second introduced mass production and mass media with the advent of electric power. The third, the digital revolution, saw us using electronics and information technology to automate production, and it gave rise to the internet. Worldwide web, mobile computing, and social media, now we are in a fourth in which technology is being fused into almost everything in the physical, digital, and biological worlds. Ubiquitous digital technologies, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, the so-called Internet of Things, 3D printing, nanotechnology, robotics, biotechnology, and a big development in materials, science, energy storage, and quantum computing. They're all starting to shake the windows and rattle the walls of the global economy. In keeping with this commentary have been the remarks of Canada's Innovation Science and Economic Development Minister, Navdeep Baines, on superclusters as the vehicle for promoting innovation. Conversation evolves around three concepts, research, funding, and the business of entrepreneurship. I had the good fortune of being able to attend the Innovation Concert uh, uh, Conference at the University of Waterloo last September and October. And uh, on one of the uh, sessions or lectures that the minister was giving us, <clears throat> he was talking about that very subject. And uh, towards the end of the, uh, the subject in his discussion, he reached his hand in his pocket and he pulled out this envelope which contained a check for $74 million. And this was a contribution by the federal government for the entire uh, complex at Waterloo, the university, Comitech, of course, in the broader, uh, we call it industrial park, which is really an old fashioned name now for what you have around Waterloo. But it was one of the first indications I had of the commitment of the federal government to a major thrust on startups with inter uh, innovation entrepreneurship and, uh, and research. Back to basics, given the promotional and enthusiastic language described in the DeVos 2016 conference, many persons see a growing and important role for community-based development, innovation, and the sustainable business model. Now I'm going to assume that most of you know of these economic conferences at DeVos, Switzerland. And the big time events, I, I can tell you, it would cost you 10 times the admission you're paying here to go to the conference at the post. I think it's $15,000 for those attending. But it's an extremely important conference in that it, uh, it paints the economic activities and framework of world countries in respect to how development is going to occur. Um, that's what I've said uh, there. The burning question is how might an assortment of vehicles under the social enterprise and innovation umbrella best strategize and become meaningful players in this growing arena. Now the business doesn't get much more serious than this because it comes down to dollars and cents and our, our ability to, uh, to attract, to qualify for assistance under these programs. In a sampling of media reports on federal financial support for science, research, and innovation, 12 Canadian universities will receive 3.5 billion to 4.8 billion dollars. The numbers are staggering. In another announcement in September 2016, 13 Canadian universities were awarded federal research funding, total 900 million. In other words, about 80 or 90 million dollars short of a billion. Note also a release on March 23rd of this year, where Minister Baines announced 400 million for venture capital investment in support of innovation. You know, we're awash in money. It sounds disrespectful, but I can't recall in my years, both in the private sector and with government, there has ever been that kind of financial commitment to drive what the government thinks and believes, and I'm sure they're right, 
a new economic base for this country. Remember the trio, research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Never have we been awash in so much cash to support a new movement. Uh, it doesn't hurt to remind ourselves, you know, the days of the so-called smokestack industries are likely in, in the past. The same thing can be said about some heavy manufacturing. Uh, it, it won't go away, but it's whole use of innovation and robotics and so on, and automobile manufacturing and so on, is turning the tide. So consequently, the government, in its wisdom, has latched onto this and apparently are making a very substantial commitment. I want to come to another aspect of that in a minute. The supporting hype to what I've just been saying is prolific. From Mr. Baines to the Irish Times to economist Mariana Mazet Kuto, I've done a great injustice to her name, uh, to Diana Lawrence's question, does Ottawa's supercluster program go far enough? A new heaven has been created. Question, where best can community-based movement stimulate and capture a share in this movement? The literature on the subject of the new economy and innovation is pervasive. The New Geography of Jobs by uh, Enrico Marietta. I'm going to get accosted for mispronouncing names here. But anyway, this is a very important new publication, and I'm not trying to impress you with my home library here at all. But the New Geography of Jobs, which fits very nicely into the discussion yesterday on the sense of place. And this particular text is new, I think it was uh, released this year. And uh, Mr. Uh, Marietta is a professor of economics at uh, University of California, Southern California. And he takes note of the major changes in the industrial base in the United States. Perhaps the best example of that is in Detroit and the, the whole dismantling of the automobile industry there uh, going back in the last 25, 30 years. There's some rebound to that. And he talks about <clears throat> the southern United States, the coal mining communities, and these other areas that are being affected right now, and how the economy is adjusting to that in new cities and new communities, and that's quite an interesting piece of work. One example, which is not featured necessarily in, in his book, is the situation in the coal mining in Virginia and Kentucky, and I'm going to assume most of you from Cape Breton here, along with myself, uh, who follow the coal mining industry because of our own industrial history will realize what the consequences of that were. Apparently, the job loss in, in West Virginia was, I don't know, 13 or 15,000. And uh, the election with Mr. Trump was uh, holding this great promise that he was going to return the miners to work. Well, for those of us who follow the <coughs> news these days, we know what has happened. The, uh, Outgoing government in the United States pointed to, I think, were 73,000 new jobs that have now been created in new energy sources, i.e. solar, windmills, and this sort of thing. The difficulty was they were not created in the mining communities. So consequently, those poor folks that were displaced by coal mines, uh, coal mine closure and so on, that did not benefit. So in the whole story, there's this business of strategic planning, if our intention is to uh, compensate these people, either there's new employment or training, then a different approach has to be taken. I think I, uh, I better watch my time here too. Um, I think there's one lesson to be learned here and I think there's uh, an element of this that Canada and Nova Scotia and Canadians can take credit for. We may disagree on the, uh, the effects of it, but in 1957-58, the federal government recognized that the coal mines in Kibraton were, were going to go broke, that we were failing. And consequently, they took measures through the Justice Rand Commission of that time and the Gordon, subsequent Gordon Commission to say, you know, this private sector can't operate these things, they just can't make money. So the government said, in some way, they looked at themselves in the mirror and said, look, we just can't allow these people to be without work. So they created what we all know today to be DEBCO. And DEBCO was created in 1967. Two divisions, coal division to go on mining the coal, and industrial development division. We don't use the term industrial development so much anymore. But it was created to try and find alternate economic activity so that come the day when the mines had to be closed that there was some, uh, some new creation of employment for them. All of this didn't work out just exactly as planned. But the principle that I feel impressed by was the fact that Canadians, Canadian governors of the day, 
took the initiative in, in a sensible move to try and compensate for the hardships that were created by that industrial readjustment here in Canada. Maybe Mr. Trump should have had a look at the Canadian history books. Um, the literature on the subject, I'm anxious to say before closing on that, uh, of the new economy and innovation is pervasive from the new geography of jobs, just as I was referring to it, by uh, Enrico Marietti, to the industries of the future by Elick Ross, another new piece of work which outlines exactly where this new trajectory in economic uh, development is, is going to go. Um, and uh, I'm just noting here something I did want to raise to you people, and it's on the whole question of, of innovation. And for those of you who are, are looking at innovation, not necessarily in the private sector alone, uh, there is a very good piece of work now being published in Nova Scotia. It's called New and Better Ways Field Guide for Nova Scotia's Innovation Ecosystem. And it's uh, written by Dr. Peter John Nicholson and Jeff Larson, only published in October of last year. Excellent piece of work, and I'm sure it's available through your library or through the university here. But at least uh, the, this province has commissioned that uh, caliber of work. Um, Looking for Bootstraps, Economic Development of the Maritimes by Donald J. Savoy, who was only released here in February of this year, to Building the New American Economy by Jeffrey Sachs. Savoy's book, uh, for those of you who follow that game, he's uh, very, very critical of federal government measures in assisting Atlantic provinces or maritime new initiatives. Uh, not necessarily in the way you would think and that is uh, restricting the flow of, of monies and funds to enable startups, but many different ways in terms of what he calls the Ottawa Mandarinet, of course, and the form of regulations that govern the, uh, the how to put it, spaceways that industry can follow when they're trying to uh, establish new, new enterprise. So what's my beef? <coughs> um, one of the things I think we have to recognize, and you know, we, we like to see uh, good announcements in the press about new startups and there's new inventions and innovation, and, and they're all good, we just don't have enough of them. But it also means we have to recognize that we're very thin on the ground in private sector and community enterprise here in the Maritimes and in Atlantic Canada generally. We have a population of the four provinces of just about 2.3 million people. Um, this Richard Salient, he's written a very interesting text, uh, Salient is Director of Economics at uh, University of Moncton, on uh, population. Um, not only is our population static, we have various forms of growth or movements of growth, particularly around urban areas, but across the board, the 2.3 million figure, and I worked in Newfoundland for eight years, at, is le if less of anything today than it was going back 10 or 15 years ago. Nova Scotia, of course, Halifax is turning out to be a great center in Atlantic provinces. A lot of credit due to the efforts they put into it. But some of the, the migration to Halifax is relocation of the population within the province and within the Atlantic region for that matter. The rest of the, the, the Maritimes are pretty stable in Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick. But the main issue, or to me, is that the total number has not changed. I find it sometimes useful to look at how are things going in the other provinces. We are a neighboring province to uh, Quebec. We are, are but uh, Maritimes are through New Brunswick. And Quebec's population is just over eight million. Bring that back to what Savoy is writing about, and he's talking about the influence, political influence, that these two central provinces have. He's got a term he uses which is not very appetizing, but you're talking about the federal government funding and so on for various enterprises. He reminds us to quote him, that big dogs eat purse. Now, I remember when I read that the first time and saying he's been very insolent, you know. But the, the point he is making, and he makes it vividly with that remark, is that the influence of Ontario and Quebec are going to supersede, you know, the much less influence of the total Atlantic provinces going forward from here. So he's putting us all on notice. This is fact of life, 
and we have to find new ways if we're going to be picking up our bootstraps, which is the title of his book, The Search for boot, uh, Bootstraps. So I'll bring that right back to ground zero. And ground zero for me is that the social enterprise and its whole phenomenon, its movement, I think, can make a greater contribution to the economic growth here at Atlantic Canada if it finds a way to move into the new phenomena with all of the money on innovation, research, and entrepreneurship. It's not easy. In many cases, if I were a pioneer in your movement, I would say, well, look, our focus is on assisting our communities. We have uh, all kinds of services where we can play a role. New Dawn, perhaps, again, the best example of this, between offering home care, of course, welding courses for people, uh, public housing, and also with the new center here, I guess you would call it a hub, others will call it a, a gateway, some will call it a cluster. Matter is not what it's called. It means that if we're going to make a more uh, measurable contribution to the economy of the Atlantic, then I think we have every right, if not a responsibility, to move into this new form. Coming back to what I said about all of this cash, okay? We're going to assume that that's available to us in not a non-responsible, but a non-obstructive way. It's not uncommon to find people say, you know, the GD bureaucrats, you know, they kill everything. Well, you know, as the next bureaucrat, I gotta defend my movement, I guess. But <clears throat> most of the bureaucrats in Atlantic Canada are well-meaning people, and they have to be influenced by the politicians. And who influences politicians? It's all of you, me, and uh, get to the politicians the message that we are, we are taking up the challenge, we are moving into the new area, in addition to the good work that the whole movement does now, we can build on that, build on that in a way that we're part of the new movement. So I, I'm pleased to see the government striking out and making a very, how would I put it, more than a realistic contribution financially now to this, to this new movement. I, uh, I think I brought your ear for just about long enough. Uh, if we were in school, I'd say if recess was going to let us out a little bit early, that would perhaps be an award or reward. I appreciate very much your patience because I rambled along with my text a bit because I worked in the trades for a while and you don't do that without picking up some of the, uh, the jargon and uh, some of that itself has been used depending on wherever, wherever you work. I'll tell you, working in Newfoundland for eight years uh, <coughs> was an education in itself in so many ways and you, you've never really enjoyed life till you work with the good folks in our new problems. So I think on that note, if some of you have some mind-blowing questions you want to put me and I can see you out there, I'd be glad to try and answer them, but I do want to thank you so very much for being patient and I hope in some modest way that some of my remarks might resonate with you. Uh, I think there's great potential for the, uh, the social uh, movement, social innovation movement. I think there's no end to the achievements that can be reached, but of no illusion, it'll take a lot of work and in closing, <clears throat> I talked earlier on about study clubs, and I don't want to close up my remarks with, without mentioning uh, an initiative now that's going on at Memorial University in, in St. John's. Started about five years ago, and it's called the Harris Institute, and it's named after uh, president, former president of the university, Mr. Harris. And it's uh, public engagement, that's its thrust. And public engagement is another word for public education and it revolves its work around many of the local issues. Uh, for example, in, in, in Newfoundland and Labrador at the moment, one of the big issues is the uh, construction of the Muskrat Falls Power Project. And uh, the Harris Institute now has taken on the role of trying to explain, to educate the consumers particularly, as to what's involved in this monstrous project. The key issue has gone from an initial estimate of 5.4 billion the last figures I've seen are 12.7. So it means that it's very distressing to the people who figure they're going to be confronted shortly with uh, electric power rates that are going to go up about 200%. So those are the issues. Also, it deals with education, health care. It deals with growth in the economy. And it's something that was done here years ago when St. Francis Ever University had its extension department and some of the folks from extension the university here today were very active in public education. It's an area where there's some good work. 
uh, that could be done in this particular generation. And ups and outs. Thank you. You've been very patient. I forgot my ball cap, so you'll have to appreciate I do this like the, the good man did here on yesterday morning. So anybody has any questions? Uh, any questions? I didn't get that question. <laughs> oh, it should go, it's right, good. Hi, I'm just wondering if you can expand a little bit on your ideas around public engagement and how that can connect with economic development. Um, what exactly, uh, how do you see public engagement relating to community e economic development? Well, <clears throat> there are really two elements. Public engagement, uh, when managed correctly, is an educational form. And it helps to bring the populace into a perspective on a number of issues or any particular issue. Uh, going back to what uh, I've been saying here, I think that uh, the social engagement movement has got the potential, much greater potential than has been exercised right now. But for people to, to fully understand the importance of that, I think public engagement is the form. It could be this university, it could be St. of X for that matter. It doesn't have to be, it can be uh, Chamber of Commerce. Here in Cape Breton, we have the Cape Breton Partnership. Uh, it's a form of describing what the opportunities are, uh, what the potential is for benefit, a new mission, new guidance for that matter, and how these things can be achieved. Now, <clears throat> there's various government agencies doing bits and pieces of that. But on the scale I'm suggesting, I think there is not only a need, but a very uh, commendable opportunity to explain to people, here's how your movement, which is so important, can move, building on what you already do, all the good work you now do, but we can move into areas that are now seen as the domain of the private sector, big corporations. Uh, Canada, of course, we have the Association of Credit Juniors. Not that many years ago, we had the, uh, the Canada Wheat Board. And these were big identities. Uh, you won't get big overnight, but there's room to move into these areas. New challenges, marketing, uh, human resource development, there's no question about it. But the potential is there, and it's a matter of having the potential defined and described in a way that we can say, okay, now I understand what you're talking about, and here's what I think we can benefit from. Coming back to what I said about the population of Maritimes, in Salian's work he also pointed out is we grow older and we look I think at our uh, population of potential entrepreneurs as people in certain age categories. Now you know I'm not going to start up a hen house tomorrow morning at my stage in life but I think that we have to recognize the reality of how our demographics change and, uh, and how we meet that. Long-winded answer to a simple question, but uh, in that answer, it would be my, my view. Okay, questions here? Um, really appreciate your talk, thank you very much. Uh, particularly at the end where you talked about the huge investment being made into a mega project, the dam project. Uh, and, uh, oh, thanks. Uh, I, I'm interested in picking up on your comments at the end about the huge investment into uh, a mega project. And I think part of what our movement is saying is that we get way more bang for our buck when we invest in local economies and create a local, diverse, integrated economy. And that mega projects that create now even one industry towns, which we know, you know didn't work in the past very well, <coughs> especially when they're, well, we'll get into the, the other side of coal. But um, how do we, convey that message that a different approach to economic development, which is uh, focused on social and ecological and uh, economic, and is really not the mega project approach. So that those large investments are not made at the exclusion of um, ignoring what, what really could have longer lasting 
uh, impacts in a, in a local area, especially in a rural Nova Scotia area. Perhaps you should give my talk. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the world is, is complex, as we all know. We're, we're living through the environmental, the green movement. Uh, going back some years, in, in government, people are like us. They breathe and bleed and everything, like all the rest of us. But they are also in a learning position. I think, and I'm an intervener at the Board of Utilities in Nova Scotia on this particular project because Nova Scotia is a partner in it. And the Nova Scotia Power Commission has invested a billion and a half dollars to run this cable we hear about from, from moving land to Nova Scotia. The criticism, I, I think, in valid in that case, and I'll come to the real answer, I think, to your question, is that good people felt we are moving green if we can generate this 800 megawatts of power, you have to convert that to kilowatt hours, into green energy. We'll go a long distance toward meeting Nova Scotia government's carbon reduction targets. Having said that, <clears throat> I think the lesson we're going to learn is that there was cheaper power available. Turn this around a little bit. It means that we have to, uh, we have to generate wealth. Uh, in other words, we have a health care system and a whole lot of other public services that require wealth. Uh, in a modest way, I think I've mentioned earlier, New Dawn, small uh, organization relative to the, to the universe, you know, has a 40 or 45 bed continuing care home here on the former radar base site. They operate a home care facility. They operate a whole lot of other things, you know, that are in health care that are generating wealth in their own particular way. Uh, the big projects have, I think, earned some disdain uh, in the government here. Uh, no other place in Cape Breton perhaps has had as much government assistance in big projects, not all of them successful. So the lessons to be learned, and we learn them every day, is that better due diligence is being applied to, by government and by agencies to the applications because it's in the interest of government to help people but also help them with competent management to understand what the risks are and how they can best be averted. Again, a long-winded response to your question, but this is a learning process and this is where if we had a, uh, a public engagement uh, forum here or maybe it's time we talk to the uh, Cape Breton Partnership and the Chamber of Commerce and others say, look, we have to do a better job of explaining to our population where the advantages are and where the, where the pitfalls are. And, and this can be done. It's been done in other jurisdictions. But you know, we have the skills and we have the potential, the energy to do all these things well. It's a matter of a bit of drive and quite a bit of hard work. <clears throat> yeah, you provided a wealth of uh, information. Um, a couple concerns I have. One is uh, 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 just to start a conversation. There is a lot of money put in now to uh, startups and so on, to innovation. In some ways, some can say it's almost like a fad. If, if we look, we look over historically, we've had all kinds of these things. Things get started and then speed it up. But also, if you look across Canada and around the world almost, you'll find this movement towards the big urban centers. It is clear in Nova Scotia, <coughs> in Ontario, it's clear in Italy, it's clear in other countries, toward these mega urban centers. And my fear is that if this type of investment, huge amounts of money, is going to exacerbate that, which is in many ways an uh, uh, organic process that's occurring, which leaves out the, the marginal areas, that they, they're no longer uh, active partners. And in that sense, then we do need uh, more long-term thinking, and the community themselves have to do it, because the big urban center have tremendous power, they can take care of themselves. The others cannot. Because with all this action, we're still getting the depopulation and so on. Just wonder. Yeah. Your, your question is not unlike the question the lady here put a few minutes ago. All these risks are, are very, very genuine. And uh, 
we'd be smart people to recognize the influence of lobbyists in our society. They're per legally permitted and uh, they exercise, exercise a lot of influence. Having said that, I think we're learning every day. I think the idea that we got to buy into big projects is waning, it's losing its attraction. And I think that we live in a political economy, which means economics and politics are linked. And uh, the, uh, the work we have to do with our political people uh, has, yet to, has yet to grow and have a greater impact. I agree with the idea. I don't think mega projects have served particularly well. You now look at the manufacturing situation in Ontario, where they have, uh, they've run into real trouble with electric energy generation. Uh, it's a balance between going green, of course, and while at the same time providing energy costs that the automobile manufacturers can live with. So it's all very complex, but I think we're smart enough people to discern where the differences are and where the turns in the road are. And I, for a moment, don't think that uh, we can't make a substantial change. Uh, I think Savoy is right. I encourage you to read his, his book and his dissertation because they point out some of the ways in which we can deal with that. Ain't easy, but uh, I would worry less about it than I, than I would be grateful that I think the education, the determination of our people is changing in a way that we are going to be able to confront that. It takes the will, but I think as Canadians and local people, we have the will to do that. I'm not going to keep you all day. Hi. Um, so, given your work history and uh, admittedly that you've uh, uh, sort of been uh, a bureaucrat yourself, I'm, I'm wondering um, how to approach uh, some of the, well, the topics that we've been talking about here are social enterprise, innovation, um, community hubs, um, to a Municipal Council um, is not familiar with a lot of um, these ideas and doesn't seem to be making an effort to uh, familiarize themselves um, and uh, sort of have, think, have a negative view of nonprofits um, uh, adopting a social enterprise model. Like, where's a good entry point? in um, opening up a, com a dialogue with um, folks who are policy makers, who are in power, but are sort of not on the same page <laughs> as us. Thank you. Uh, you'll think that I'm going to cheat or I'm ducking the question here, I guess. But the basic ingredient for all of us is finding a way to educate ourselves. <laughs> Uh, the councillors, you know, they're, they're good people like all the rest of us, they do their, their best job. But because the world is getting more complex, and I find this personally in some of the things I write, if I don't spend some extra time researching some of the things I talk about, it doesn't mean all you folks are going to agree with me at all. But <clears throat> it means that I, I have to understand the issue as best I can. I think that uh, uh, we have to uh, press council to make, uh, make council more accessible. Uh, for example, there's a lot of pressure on council for the day-to-day -day services. I know where my wife and I live, you know, we could spend literally billions of dollars fixing potholes. Well, I've got some other places where I'd like to see a share of that billion go, as important as potholes are. So to bring it back to, you, to the good sense of your question, I think education, as best we can manage it, is the starting point. So we understand what the issue is, and we can then best express ourselves with colleagues and with neighbors and so on to see if we can't get some action from council if there is an agreement that our issue is, uh, is merit of some change in attention. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Alec Morrison and I'm a municipal politician. <laughs> Had a boy. And the first thing I'd say is don't let the bastard turn you down. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know to which council you're referring, but I'm a council.
counselor in Annapolis County, and at our meetings, there are always sessions at which presentations can be made by concerned citizens, either on their own behalf or on behalf of their organizations. Now, just as most of us who have been to university have spent 16 or more years being educated, don't think that you can educate a county council in its entirety or a portion thereof in one 10 minute presentation, which is why I indicated, and I think it's what Pat said as well, the education of counselors is no different than the education of any other sector in our community, and, and just keep at it. And if you're good at it, if you're brief at it, and if you don't call us stupid before you start to talk, uh, you, will, you will meet with, I think, good, reasonable, and receptive results. I, I just want to give one example. I spent six years helping to represent Canada at the United Nations, and my expertise was in the field of international conflict resolution and arms control. And we would get two groups of people who would come down, and they'd walk into my office, I hate the government of Canada, I hate you, you're wrong, you're stupid, you're going to blow us all to hell, now will you help me? <laughs> and the second group would come and say, we don't agree with the position of the government of Canada. Can you help us understand it more? Can you tell us how to get it changed? And can you introduce us to other diplomats to help us? And guess which group got the honey? So treat the politicians kind. Uh, we want to be educated and keep up a good job. I'm not going to attempt an answer because in many ways your, your answer contained a lot of wisdom and that's uh, what I think everybody can uh, enjoy and can appreciate. So thank you very much. Hi. Um, yep. Good morning. I just, you know, try not to have too much of a conversation here rather than a question, but I, I appreciated your recommendation around education, but I'm, I'm remembering yesterday's <coughs> plenary where we were reminded that really information is not changing minds anymore. That people need to feel a connection with issues and I think that we're, we're becoming estranged from a time when facts actually meant something. So I was a town councillor for eight years in my community and what I found was most effective was the storytelling in which people could find themselves in the story. And then the information made sense. It didn't help that much if we came with all the research and the data, because I think, and, and I struggle with that too, I'm very interested in, in data and research and results, but what I'm finding less and less persuasive is information in and of itself. But the wonderful thing about our, our community stories is that they are stories and that we find our places in that. And I think that's what we need to be doing um, in telling what we're doing and in influencing people because we are a part of those stories and that's what makes it different from when the, the big money comes to the big business. So I wonder if you have any anything to add around that. I know that the foundations of the, the Antigonish movement were about people's lives and experiences and stories too. Uh I'll stand by my, my remarks on uh, public engagement. Um, and uh, I think there's nothing, and I've argued this with past president St. of X, I'm a graduate of that school, uh, of the uh, disappointment when uh, extension, or a large portion of extension was disbanded, and, and I understand some of the reasons for that. But I, I think education information, <clears throat> and I agree with you on the fact that uh, information flow is not always answering our questions. There's a worrying aspect of that right now, at least I find it worrying, and it's not right to your point, but many of the major publication houses in Canada, National Post and others, are now seeking uh, federal government financial assistance to maintain their, their publications. Distilling that down a little bit brings us down to the caliber of reporting, 
uh, and I'm not grumbling about our, our media here, I, I think we're in general pretty well served, but it means the analysis of issues uh, sometimes is dispensed with because of a shortage of budget. Don't know what the answer is to that, but I think your point is very valid and that uh, it, the, the, uh, the issue is not irresolvable, but it does mean that we have to find some ways of lobbying and pressuring the authorities, whether it's the newsprint owners and so on, that we expect more. The issue is a little uh, hazy too because we're going into social media and I'm sure you would know what that's all about, you probably uh, are a participant in that, but it means that the whole information flow is being uh, altered in ways that some people would say is biased, some people would say it's unfair or unjust, other people just don't like the answers. But in that complex, I think there has to be the, the method for us to get through the fog and find, uh, because God knows we need people like you and the other gentlemen from Annapolis here who have you know, the courage to run for public office. And uh, I think that we have to blend those things in a way that we find a solution. Thank you for your question. You're not going to get a fast recess, after all. Thank you, Paul Carter. It's because you have excellent topics to talk about. So I just wanted to highlight two things. One, the time has changed in this generation. Uh, we used to have lifelong employment. We used to have products that lasted for a very long time. So your emphasis on innovation and willingness to change is critically important. It also means we need to change what we're looking at. Uh, I come from Waterloo, so, uh, you know, pros and cons, but whatever. So it's great to have a Blackberry story, that company that grows enormously, suddenly, you know, it starts as a little startup, and suddenly it's got 12,000 employees. It's got 8,000 employees in your town. Wow, what a great story. Whoops, a new competitor has come along and cut their production, cut their employment in half. So the important lesson to me was I was shocked. The most important thing, the community celebrated the first thousand employees that are left off from BlackBerry were the asset that helped the other startups build. The next thousand, and suddenly you're seeing what is a tragedy. I mean, and individually, it's not an easy thing to transition, but en masse, we had thousands of people transit out of one successful firm to help create many others. Now, that's not necessarily comfortable in the transition. But the economy has continued to thrive because of the diversity of innovation and opportunity. What it is, it's the investment in the talent. And the talent can change from one firm to the next. What's true for BlackBerry and the other tech startups, which are still growing, more jobs all the time, is also true for our social enterprises. You, know, you have the, the social operations emphasizing energy uh, services. Suddenly, the economy or the government policy changes, the funds aren't available on the energy services side, and you realize, oh, well, now there's a bigger emphasis on water. So the talent shifts from energy services to water services. In this era of having these short product cycles, we are seeing changes in demand. We need to emphasize the talent of our people and our resilience to be able to change. And it's amazing the success that people are having. We need to look at the long-term trends. We need to look beyond the headline that says, oh, uh, those high-priced uh, solar cells are what caused the price of electricity to go up. Absolutely false. What's happened with the price of electricity from solar? It has dropped by 80% over the last decade. Not many products had an 80% reduction in price. Now the total cost of the product is less than what we used to pay the installer to put it on the roof. Huge reduction. Uh, costs are driven much more by, by the nuclear prices of the global adjustment time. I'm happy to talk about details. But the message that I think that you share of innovation can help us all by recognizing the most important part, and that's our talent. And that's where I think you've got the right up idea of the creativity of people in our communities, and that we can adjust and create a better future. Thank you very much. You have to be the Wizard of Oz to try and provide a wise response to that because it covers so many, so many points. The only thing I'm going to say is this. Uh, there was a very famous economist uh, some years ago who now uh, has various messages printed over his name. 
and it was uh, George Trish Schumpeter. And Schumpeter says, it's not change that we have to worry about. He said, it's the pace of change, it's the rate. And I think you probably agree with that. So it comes back down to my little example about uh, coal mining in the United States, where ine inevitably with the move, the green movement and so on, and this is happening right across Canada, the United States and other coal producing countries. What we failed to do, or what they failed to do, was anticipate the implications of this for the number of people who are going to be thrown out of work and lose their livelihood. And I think the U.S. is learning the hard way, and, uh, and I come back to my example where I thought at 40 years ago, Canada, I think, deserves some credit for what it did just here in the coal mining thing of, of Cape Breton. Didn't solve all the problems, but they certainly recognized the immediate impact. Thank you very much.